In this video, we'll be covering the Clostridia. Four major pathogens in the Clostridium genus cause illness in humans. They are C. botulinum, which causes a deadly foodborne illness, C. perfringens, which, that causes a not so deadly foodborne illness and wound infections, C. tetani, that causes a deadly wound infection, and C. difficile, that causes a serious GI infection that is a significant cause of death in the elderly and immunocompromised. The general characteristics of the genus are the following. These are gram-positive, strict anaerobes, for the most part, obligate fermenters. They are spore formers, in most cases. They are ubiquitous in soil, with many saprophytes that are harmless in the soil and just degrading things. You'll find them in water, and they're also part of the normal flora of many people. They are also classified as firmicutes. Pathogenic costria can cause several types of infections. They can invade the skin and soft tissues of the body. Some can cause food poisoning, while others cause antibiotic-associated diarrhea and colitis. Why is this species such a problem? First, they are able to survive adverse conditions in the environment because they form endospores. Second, because of their rapid growth. Clostridium perfringens has a generation time of 6.5 minutes in rich medium, making it possible for this microbe to grow rapidly in improperly prepared food. Many of the species produce toxins and some of them are very potent. Tetanus toxin and botulinum toxin are lethal to humans with nanogram quantities able to kill. In fact, they are some of the most deadly poisons known. Clostridium difficile is probably the pathogen of most importance at this time. It was not identified until 1978 as a disease agent. Today, it is the main cause of infectious diarrhea after hospitalization and antibiotic use. It's estimated that 13 of 1,000 acute care patients will be infected with this pathogen. Close to 500,000 cases were reported in 2015, 100,000 in nursing homes. It's a significant cause of death in the country with 29,000 deaths per year in the U.S. Incidence of complications is relatively high from this infection. It was originally a main problem for the elderly, but there are increased cases in young people with no previous antibiotic use and in the community, so it seems to be becoming more of a problem. C. diff is a complicated infection in humans. It appears to be part of the normal microbiota of some people and causes no problem in them. Some strains are non-toxigenic and colonize humans asymptomatically. However, some strains produce toxins that cause mild to severe bloating and abdominal pain. In some patients with a strong IgG response to the toxins made by C. diff, they are able to control the infection. In the absence of a strong immune response, C. diff pathogenesis occurs. This includes fever, leukocytosis, which is high white blood cell count, pseudomembranous colitis, which is inflammation of the colon caused by C. diff, and toxic megacolon, a large dilation of the colon, sepsis, shock, and death. The toxic megacolon is the result of an expression of two toxins, TCDA and TCDB. These are classic AB toxins that damage cells by inactivating RAC and Rho GTPases. The RAC and Rho GTPases are important in cell signaling molecules and their inactivation causes cell rounding and apoptosis. This results in a strong inflammatory response the formation of pseudomembrane, growth of the bacteria and gas, and finally a significant distension of the abdomen. It is important to prevent the spread of C. diff, especially in healthcare settings. These behaviors can decrease the spread of the illness. Good hand hygiene. Disinfecting common equipment. For example, electronic thermometer handles have been shown to spread this illness if not disinfected. The use of sporocidal hypochlorite to get rid of the spores in, in, in areas, and then changing antibiotic prescriptions. Penicillin and vancomycin seem to lower the risk of this, where, while cephalosporins or clindamycin increase the incidence. The illness is often brought on by treatment with antibiotics, and it was somewhat ironic 
that a typical treatment is with further antibiotic treatment. In 20% of cases, there is a recurrence of illness. In extreme cases, surgery to remove the affected region of the colon is sometimes employed. Fecal microbiota transplantation is a new treatment that I will talk about on the next slide. It's actually a relatively new treatment. Investigations by Weingarten et al. indicate that the disease arises when antibiotic treatment suppresses the normal microbiota. Compare the left panel, healthy donors, with the middle, which are patients infected with C. diff. You can see there's a large perturbation in the microbiota. Bacteria that normally metabolize bile acids to secondary products are lost. These secondary bile acids normally inhibit C. difficile, and in their absence, the bacterium germinates and grows to high numbers. The work by Weingarten showed that if afflicted patients were given a microbiota from a healthy donor, it restored their microbiota to normal, as you can see in the right panel. These patients were given a donor microbiota. After just a few days, their microbiota returned to normal and they were cured of the disease in 95% of patients in this test and then 85% over the years that the treatment has been used. Okay, one minute paper. Clostridium difficile is a strict air anaerobe. How can it spread from one infected individual to another? The answer is, it's a spore-forming bacterium. These endospores are resistant to oxygen, and even though the vegetative cells can't grow in the presence of oxygen, the spores can survive in the presence of oxygen and spread from patient to patient that way.